Jashjeet is going to speak with us today in a session entitled From Good Intentions to Real Impact. Thank you so much, Jashjeet. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. It's nice to see many uh, familiar faces. Um, obviously, it's uh, not easy shoes to fill uh, with the replacement I'm having to do. And certainly, those of you who saw Anil yesterday, that's a tough one to match. But I'll try my best. So we are going to talk about impact. Anybody here wants to have impact? That's the spirit. So uh, the, the title of the talk today is uh, From Good Intentions to Real Impact. And uh, this is, in a way, a summary of uh, what I've been working on, teaching, and thinking about over about the past 10 years at INSEAD. Uh, I've actually been at INSEAD for 18 years. And before I start the talk, just to share a little bit uh, about uh, how you know, I ended up where I am. Let me see if I can get, yep. Uh, so a lot of people think that professors are just bumming around, right? They ask me, how many times a week do you teach? I say, I teach about 150 hours a year. And people say, OK, what do you do for the rest of, uh, rest of the time? It, it turns out, actually, on the inside, life as a professor is hard work. Or at least I'd like to say that, because I do want to be paid uh, and, and continue to be uh, paid. And professors face their own different KPIs. You know, as companies, all of you are sort of juggling, this is what I want to achieve in life. And at the same time, I'm working in an organization, and I'm responsible for my PL or returns, and so on. We have our own KPIs. A lot of them are around research. And especially in the early years, um, I don't know if you're aware, uh, we have a up or out tenure system in academia, as in most places, very roughly speaking, sometime around seven or eight years into life at INSEAD, you get evaluated on whether you're good enough to stay or uh, you'll be politely asked to exit. Thankfully, I survived that. Um, but you know, that's the point at which you know, I, I was still teaching my regular strategy topics, uh, core course, I elective on global strategy, but I was thinking, what next? And in the background, what had been happening was this conversation that I've been you know, more a spectator to by that point, where the business leaders were congratulating one another on how, they, how great they were. Uh, there were buzzwords like fortune at the base of the pyramid, creating shared value and all of that, doing well by doing good. I, at the same time, on the outside, not everybody was convinced that business and indeed even business schools were a good thing. Uh, for the world. So, so there was that schizophrenia in my life that I was trying to deal with. I did what a lot of people do in these circumstances. Uh, you go to these uh, meditation retreats where you lock yourself up for 10 days, you wake up 4 a.m. every morning, reflect on life, uh, and try to concentrate for uh, meditation sessions. You sleep on flat beds, and instead of a pillow, they give you a wooden block. You know, it helped some bit, but at the same time, whenever I got out of that, I was back to my normal, conflicted self. And I was like, OK, I need to not think of this as something to escape from, but something that I need to confront. I said, OK, I'll try to learn on what's happening on the outside of the business world. And that's where I spent a lot of time uh, working in the development sector, but also, I mean, just understanding, just visiting people, and even within the business world, businesses that were genuinely trying to have impact. My focus in the early years was more social than environmental. Now it's increasingly uh, getting balanced. Um, traveling around, uh, visiting social enterprises, nonprofits, businesses working in that space, and trying to learn on what people were doing. And one of the interesting and exciting things to me was that there was a genuine conversation around thinking of business not just as a way of making money, but as a tool for impact, right? So the conversation in many quarters was starting with, we want to make a positive difference. A lot of times, business is indeed the right way of approaching these issues, while recognizing that there are other settings in which we do need the other tools. And that's what I wanted to focus on. 
you know, there was a very clear recognition, though, that, of course, the free par market view, where we are just taking prices as a signal of value, and there's market value creation, products and services that people care about, you know, jobs being created, that was immensely valuable as well. But there were issues and concerns that were being left behind in particular dimensions like inequality, uh, climate, and, and so on. So that's what I started to focus on. And the point of view that I take in all work that I do is saying, OK, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We know that business is good in a lot of ways, right? Uh, the whole idea is it helps us decentralize decision making. Price indeed is a valuable signal of the value uh, you might be uh, creating or not creating. But there are externalities, there are um, you know, ethical issues that do not get addressed. So rather than thinking of having impact as something that you do independent of business, my point of view is let's see what business is doing well. But then if business leaders have this intentionality, this sensitivity towards things it is not doing well, we try to bring that into the conversation as well. And, and the buzzword for that is intentionality, saying we are going to be diligent about really trying to move the frontier on dimensions on which business is failing, rather than just saying we are going to completely you know, replace business. Yes, because we've tried that in many countries around the world in the past 50 years, and it turns out it hasn't worked out very well. So those are topics on which then I started to do research. So my research is uh, indeed, um, you know, as in other, uh, for other academics, a lot of it is published in journals where, on average, if five people read it, it's considered a successful paper. Um, but I think a lot of value is in the thought process that goes into it, and in the process, not just work I do, but then it helps me interpret the work that's been done globally that I try to condense and make sense of. And then I write more practitioner-oriented articles, including a lot uh, which are in INSEAD uh, knowledge. If, if you're interested in my work more uh, broadly, you're welcome to uh, look it up. And that then forms also the basis of the teaching that I do. In particular, since about 2014, 2015, I've been teaching elective cost strategy and investing for impact. I see some of uh, the students from the earlier, uh, earliest cohorts of that here. I really hope they will not tell the others that I'm still showing the same slides that I was showing six, seven years ago. I promise I have changed uh, some of them. Um, similarly, I try to bring some of these conversations in the executive programs. I've been directing a program called INSEAD Social Entrepreneurship Program. I also uh, teach in sustainability programs and, and, and so on. So what I'm going to you know, talk about today, in a way, is a one-hour condensed version of what I just finished teaching in 21 hours of my uh, MBA uh, course here, which I taught uh, two sections of in May in Singapore and two sections here in Fontainebleau. I'm normally uh, based in, uh, in Singapore, but very conveniently, I come here to teach in P3, P5 in June and not in December. It has absolutely nothing to do with the weather in France. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the starting point uh, for me is the observation that you know, the journey that I've gone through as an academic is a journey that I've seen lots of people go through even uh, in business, including as alumni, saying I've been fighting this battle for years. And at the end of it, you know, maybe I was successful to some extent, and then I'm starting to question myself on you know, what I, I, I've been doing, uh, and, and you know, can I do better, right? And what I like to do is say, OK, you know, we are in SIA. This is the smartest people that you'll find uh, in the world. The, these are the best leaders you'll find in business, and take it for granted that, of course, you can meet the KPIs and the business goals that you have, but surely you're looking for something more than that in your life. Because if you won't stretch yourself, who will? Right? And who's, if you're not the crowd that's going to think about societal issues uh, at the intersection of uh, business, uh, then who's going to do that? And so the whole point of my course is to take this notion of impact. And I say, OK, let's take this conversation where from the outside, very often business leaders are being seen as, hey, you know, you're just greedy, you just care about money, and you don't care about anything else. And we know that's not true. I've interacted with enough uh, people over the past 20 years 
to say, okay, my hypothesis is that the roadblock very often is not uh, about people not caring, but it's about perhaps having deeper conversations about impact that just don't happen in the business world. And, and that's uh, the topic uh, on which I'll be elaborating on today. So when I talk about impact, for me, the definition of that is uh, pretty simple at some level. At the same time, perhaps it's a very high bar, but a useful one to keep in mind, saying if you're trying to define impact you know, for yourself, for your project, for your organization, a useful starting point is simply to say, imagine the world with your project or unit, and imagine the world without you, and that delta really is the impact, right? We can write 100-page long impact reports, but ultimately, that's what the definition of impact comes down to. So the important point here is that I believe intentions are very helpful in taking us to impact, but it's not a given, right? Very often, we just assume we have good intentions, we have good things, and good outcomes will happen. And my argument is there's, you need to get as serious about managing impact if you really care about fixing the, uh, the gaps that the market leaves behind as, uh, as you are when you're managing uh, your business. And just to give an example of how there can be a big gulf between intentions and impact, here's an example that I very often teach uh, when I you know, take uh, a first case study about making this distinction. This is a poster child case study from the development space of a social enterprise uh, called Play Pump. And what they said was, they started in South Africa around 18, 19 years ago uh, by a guy called Trevor Field, who had retired from the, his, his job as a sales guy. And he says, I want to give back. He noticed access to clean drinking water was very often a, a challenge in poor communities in rural South Africa and beyond. Uh, so what he came up with was, in fact, he, he, he brought in, he didn't come up with the device, but he noticed this device which could be applied in this context, saying, can we come up with a merry-go-round uh, that will have a pumping action attached to it so that when children play on the merry-go-round, water pumps, and people get access to water. It, it was a very sexy story that appeals to a lot of donors because you know, the story is we are uh, bringing play equipment to children who don't have play equipment. Uh, at the same time, you're bringing access to clean drinking water to communities that don't have that. The burden of getting water uh, very often used to fall on women or girls in the family. So you know, the girls are over, uh, overworked missing school sometimes, women are having to travel miles or kilometers, depending on which country uh, you, you come from. And so this was a very happy, happy uh, story uh, that got a lot of excitement. So Trevor Field managed to get major funding, $5 million from the Case Foundation, another $11 million from USAID. Um, the projections were within three or four years, they'll go up to $60 million in funding, and uh, this will be rolled out to 4,000 villages. Amazing uh, story, all TV channels, social media, everything picks it up. At the same time, ultimately, it turned out to be one of the biggest uh, disasters in the development space. Because what went wrong, right? So what went wrong was, it was a sexy story that was selling. Nobody was asking the communities what they needed. Nobody was making sure uh, there was actually maintenance having, uh, happening on the ground. Kids had to play hours a day. It turns out even if it's a poor kid, you, you can't convince them to play if they don't want to play. And this was not the best device for adults to, uh, to, to be operating. Women thought they looked a bit silly when they were making, uh, trying to make the uh, merry-go-round go around you know, with cars passing on, on a highway uh, close by. The capacity was much lower because of this inefficient pumping mechanism unlike a hand pump, and the result was in communities in which the pumps were working, very often there was overcrowding and not enough water, right? Uh, to a point where UNICEF even issued a report saying, well, this is uh, leading to what you could classify as child labor in many villages where the children were being forced to play. Uh, and, and despite that, uh, for a year or two, the project continued until it ultimately, all of this sort of scandal made it to a major TV channels and so on. 
where it you know, largely imploded, except that now it's still operating at a very small scale. And guess who's funding it? It's CSR departments from some corporates, right? So, so, so it's still alive and well, but at a much smaller scale with a completely different management team. But this illustrates what I think, you know, even if the example comes from a development space, I think this illustrates anything, uh, you know, when we're talking about impact, three things to keep in mind, right? So the first is not about what are the in just the intentions of the project or even the scale of the project, but what outcome are you actually achieving? What problem are you actually solving, right? So that's the first question. The second is how effective are you at solving that problem, right? And you can't that, uh, ask that question without asking what is the alternative today? There's typically an existing solution to almost any problem even if it's not obvious to you, but it exists. In this case, actually, it might be obvious to us if we think a little bit, which is the hand pumps. It turns out that you know, a hand pump fully installed is about one-fourth of the price uh, of a play pump. And in fact, there is you know, a large fraction of the hand pumps in rural areas around the world are not functioning, and they could be repaired just for a few hundred dollars each. So if you think of you know, really cost-effective use of money in development, it would probably be the ch to channel it towards repairing existing hand pumps rather than installing this sexy gadget for which local ecosystem doesn't exist to do the maintenance. People are not you know, uh, skilled. And by the way, the contractors are getting paid for every pump installed because that's the key metrics. How many plums, pumps did you install? And you get paid, let's say, $1,000 for that. The end result is in some villages, it was going as far as a truck shows up, the contractors come out, they dig up a perfectly functioning hand pump, replace it with a play pump, the play pump stops working in three months, and the village stops getting access to water. Right? So, so, so this is sort of the, the, the challenge with donors far away focusing on just one simple metric, looking at pretty pictures of smiling African kids, while nobody is actually thinking on behalf of the community, nobody's on the ground seeing is it really making the key difference? Who's accountable for the real outcome versus us congratulating each other and giving each other you know, CSR Company of the Year award uh, just because somebody has some pretty pictures? And so the broader point here is you know, this kind of thinking about A, what is your impact in solving the problem? And not just that, going beyond that, asking what is your net impact? which is your impact minus the unintended consequences you ended up uh, imposing on a particular issue, on a particular uh, community, and trying to deal with that. Right? So let's take a couple of examples from the environmental space. You might be a fashion brand, a fast fashion brand, who is environmentally conscious, and you've come up with a new product line, which is made up of recycled fabric, and so you feel isn't it great? Am I not good for the world? You pat yourself on the back that your product is a very green product. Now, it turns out that depending on how you market it and how you position it and how you deal with the customer, you could do you know, what Patagonia does, which is make the customer really think hard about, OK, this product might have a smaller environmental footprint, but it does have an environmental footprint. So you should buy it only if you need it. And if you buy it, then you should not buy something else instead. Versus ju just pushing this product as the next cool green product that you now add guilt-free to your wardrobe on top of the 20 Zara garments you already have, in which case you haven't really contributed positively to the world. You've con still, in fact, very likely contributed negatively to the world if most of the customers are buying it as one extra product rather than a product replacing their existing product. And, and sort of that's, again, the, the, the kind of thinking to keep in mind. So if you just say, this year I sold one million of recycled material clothes, that's not a good metric of impact unless you tell me what would have happened otherwise. Can you tell me that these clothes really have replaced you know, clothes that had much higher footprint, in which case I believe you. But if you can't make that claim, you have to be a little bit careful in making grand uh, statements about your impact. Similarly, let's take another very common thing, uh, which is planting trees, right? Planting trees is a fantastic thing, and uh, lots of organizations around the world are doing it. But what we should be careful about is planting trees, again, you know, the number of trees you planted is not a metric of impact. 
is just a metric of your scale. If the trees that you planted end up burning in a forest fire, or you know, when they are still young, getting eaten by the, uh, by the cattle, or even worse, if you know, the contractor that you told to plant trees first cleared some forest to plant trees, uh, in a which happens, by the way, in a location where these are not native trees, you're not going to achieve any meaningful outcomes, let's say, in terms of the environmental impact. And in fact, if you do all of this, and on top of that, now this is claimed as carbon credits, and all of us are flying here guilt-free because we bought some of those carbon credits, the end result of that is the emissions are real, uh, but the benefits of trees are halfway fictitious. So on the whole, you, you made the system not only neutral, but you made it worse. And so that's why there is this big debate right now, at a minimum about quality of offsets, uh, carbon offsets, and then more generally about carbon offsets should not be the starting point. It's the very last resort. Before that, you have to think about you know, what the, uh, what the uh, your emissions are, can you reduce that? So if you look at you know, science-based targets initiative, the conversations are, we are not even going to get, give you credit for offsets. We only are going to give you credit for emissions removal, sorry, emissions reduction and actual carbon removal. And yes, carbon credits is a nice to have thing, but it's, it can't be the primary way for us to make progress on global uh, net zero if that's what we wanted to do. But again, you know, these are things which at an intuitive level might not be obvious. And you need to dig deeper if you're serious about these things to really be sure that the impact that you think you're having or the story that's being told actually makes sense once it goes to the data and the evidence and, and the details. So all of this is to say that when we are uh, talking about impact, we have to make this distinction between intentions and impact. And in particular, what happens is it, it, it's actually rude. It's impolite in the impact space to criticize anybody, right? So if somebody comes to you uh, with a business model, for sure you'll rip it apart. You'll ask them 20,000 questions about it. If somebody comes up with you uh, with an impact idea, you say, isn't that lovely? You're trying to contribute to the world. What a nice guy. And if you ask them, how does this really have impact? You're like, at least he's doing something or she's doing something. What are you doing, right? So, so, so and we have to be a little bit careful. Um, on the one hand, of course, we absolutely should be encouraging and admiring people that are trying to make positive difference. But, you know, at the community level, we should keep an eye on what is being achieved and not just on, you know, people sort of doing good things and feeling happy about it and just congratulating uh, one another uh, without necessarily achieving the outcomes, and in some cases, uh, potentially making things uh, much worse uh, rather than better. Right. So this, so this goes back to then, what does this mean for for your career? Right. So one of the things that um, I emphasize a lot in my classes is, look, uh, things like me showing up in Cambodia for a house building trip, or you going for a beach cleaning project. I think it's great. Right. This is your way or my way to engage with the world, you know, build a little bit of humility, connect with others. It's a fantastic corporate team building activity, but let's recognize exactly for what it is, right? This is not the biggest way in which people like INSEAD MBAs are going to contribute to the world. There, there is sort of much bigger things you could be doing within the scope of your work, wherever that work is. It can be large company, it can be small company, it can be development sector, you can be a climate activist. Very often, the opportunities are um, always there to do much better, right? So let's say you're in the financial space. To start with, you can say, okay, I am skilled in finance, so let me have a conversation about what's happening in ESG space more generally, right? It's been booming like crazy. Um, or, you know, impact space more narrowly, which is a much narrower space because it goes much further in... Um, both having strategy for and commitment and measurement for impact being delivered. But both of these spaces are right now a, at a very genuine risk of falling into what people would call greenwashing. Because on the one hand, there are people that are really serious about it, really focusing on the impact, measuring it, trying to improve it. On the other hand, there's a lot of people in there who either intentionally or purely for lack of skill are in there telling an impact story on impact that doesn't exist, right? 
For example, there was this article in, in Business Week in December, which points out this you know, slightly inconvenient fact that most of the ESG investing is a, a strategy about how does, let's say, climate impact our business. It is not mostly about how do we impact climate. Now, the two are correlated, right? But saying that just because I'm making sure that I don't get screwed up by the environmental impact that I'm causing is not going to be enough for us to achieve what needs to be achieved for us to actually genuinely uh, work on the environmental crisis in a way that our children and our grandchildren get to live in a world that's sort of as livable uh, as what we live in, right? So, so the conversation then is, if we are thinking about impact, we should try hard to think about where is it that our leverage points are the most, right? And, and yes, I absolutely believe that follow your passion is a useful starting point of the conversation, but it's not enough. Uh, and, and yes, you have to start with uh, what are your passions and you know, what are your goals, financial or non-financial, but you also have to ask, what is the real societal need? How big is it? How critical is it? And then the third question, what do I bring on the table? You know, what is my competitive advantage if I'm trying to, uh, trying to contribute to this particular space? So the challenge if you're doing through this through business, of course, is that you have to balance both the business side, which is already hard enough as we know, but the impact side, and what I'm essentially saying here is the impact is not automatic even if your intentions are good, and just scale is not a good measure of impact. So what does this mean? This means, okay, so we have to make sure that we are really getting our business model right, right? And the starting point is to recognize that the reality is, despite all the hype about the customer cares and Gen Z and millennials and all of that, the reality today still is, for most customers, yes, they will care about impact, as long as A, it doesn't require them to pay a lot more, B, they don't see it as a compromise on basic functional attributes of your product and service. If that's not there, you will always remain a niche player, even if you do manage to survive. Just as an example, um, a social enterprise in the UK called Aspire, it was started by you know, two very well-meaning uh, graduates uh, just out of college, who saw the homelessness issue and they said, okay, we are going to employ homeless people in our business and this is you know, pre-internet uh, uh, era or, or certainly before uh, internet main, uh, went mainstream saying, okay, we are going to train homeless people, employ them and we are going to build a business that's as competitive as uh, any other catalog business. It turns out it, it was a little impractical uh, because there's a very good reason uh, why the homeless people were homeless, and a lot of them were struggling with um, issues like, you know, they were recently out of jail, many of them had drug problems, many of them had alcohol problems. So if you're employing them, and uh, you're expecting your business, they want to have, uh, be as competitive as one of your competitors who's not, and then you're expecting your customers to really value that, and to a point that you can scale up as a successful business, it didn't happen. In the beginning, of course, they got a lot of press, you know, the prime minister shopping at their uh, store, and yes, indeed, communities trying to support the homeless people uh, in their region, but this is not something that they were consistently able to maintain. Uh, not surprisingly, this, the, the business side of this folded, and then they ended up going back to the uh, nonprofit model. The, the other thing is, which is even trickier, is what I call the impact model, right? So if you're really serious about impact, you have to define what problem you're solving. You have to have a credible strategy that we believe can get you there, and you have to measure to, to, to see are you actually able to achieve it. And so one of the stories here, uh, very often that gets discussed in this space, is Tom's, right? Originally called Tom Shoes, but then they dropped the shoes because uh, uh, Tom's uh, started to go into other areas. But cumulatively, Tom's has, through its buy one, give one model, which by the way has inspired hundreds of companies to pick it up after Tom's did, given shoes to 90 million kids globally, right? 90 million, think about the scale, right? 
At the same time, it has been criticized severely by the development people uh, through you know, hard data, something that Tom's also acknowledged that the impact was simply not there in a way that they were telling the story, right? Because what they were doing very often was giving shoes that might be inappropriate for the kids. Shoes very often were not in the top 20 or 30 uh, needs of the kids, and there were concerns like it was creating a culture of dependence, you know, something that has been discussed in the aid space more, more broadly, that the right way to development is enable local entrepreneurship rather than make communities dependent on handouts uh, from overseas permanently. And then even things like this was causing the local shoemakers to go out of business and all of that, right? So Tom subsequently ended up having to deal with this and diversify to try to increase impact. And then, you know, more recently, they, they ran into other trouble because uh, I think both their business model and impact model became a little bit sort of too inconsistent. And uh, uh, the original founder ended up leaving the company two years ago. But think about it. 90 million shoes, it looks like a great headline number. But when the founder himself acknowledges that that was not, you know, in hindsight, achieving the impact, this shows how, you know, the consumer is buying into the easy, simple story, but the impact is much more nuanced. And if you really care, you have to care as a business yourself. Very often, you'll be ahead of the customer. So just relying on the customer to be able to make a full assessment on whether the impact is there or not there is a little bit tricky. The other point here is you know, not to beat up on examples like Play Pump or, or Tom's, because you know, one of the feedback that I get from a lot of my MBA students at the end of the term was that it was a very thoughtful course, but it leaves me depressed, and what now? So it's like, mm, uh, uh, e, e, and you know, I've been, I've been sort of doing this fine tuning of, I give some of these examples, but then every now and then I insert a happy story in there to, uh, but I think I need to work with my uh, OB colleagues to, to, to improve that side of the course to, to actually um, get the mood up. But it's an important point, which is impact space is complicated. And a lot of people think of this as, oh, I've now been doing business, now I'll do a little bit of impact on the side. And it's not as simple. It's something that you really need to invest in. It takes years, and it needs a problem-solving mindset, which is uh, you need to have the humility to recognize that where you started might not be the right place. That's all right. You know, we, we do that in entrepreneurship all the time. When was the last time that a major you know, billionaire got created through a perfect business model that was uh, unchanged since the first uh, uh, business plan competition that they participated in? There's no reason to expect that it, this is going to be any different in the impact space. Now, what does this mean practically? So one issue that always comes up is, OK, so does this mean there are always trade-offs, right? And yes, certainly there are some companies. And here I'll give a shout out to Proximity Designs in Myanmar that we worked with, which, by the way, is, is a superb social enterprise with close to 1,000 people explicitly working with smallholder farmers in Myanmar, right? So people think social enterprise, 10 people. The people just doing good things on the side. No, this is a professionally run business that puts impact first, makes trade-offs, and recognize for certain things it's just going to have to depend on grant funding, and that's OK. By the way, uh, just on the side, on my LinkedIn, just yesterday I posted uh, a, a, a job position looking for, uh, 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 for a, a global role at, uh, at this, if this is a space of interest to um, any of you, because I just got an email from the co-founder yesterday um, of this organization. Um, but more generally, right, so, so there are lots of entrepreneurs out there who are saying, OK, no, we don't accept the trade-offs. We think we can have impact, real impact, at scale in a way that the scale is integrated into the business model. Do they have it perfect in version 1.0? Not necessarily. But I think there's a lot of interesting things happening uh, for people when they're thinking about this from a lens of how much progress can we make in building business models which are having real impact, that are science-based, that are measured, uh, while at the same time uh, 
potentially building a business that's going to uh, have a valuation in the billions as uh, Impossible has. I think Impossible is still private with a valuation in the seven, eight, nine billion. Uh, Beyond has gone through ups and downs after going public, but I think it's still valued somewhere at a few uh, billion dollars. Uh, but for them, the main thing is, okay, look, if we really want to contribute to the climate issue, making vegetarian sort of protein substitutes, uh, which are targeting the vegetarian customer, we are not the right people for that. That's a very small segment in the developed world, especially in the US where this started. Just 5% or less of the people are vegetarian. What we want to do is we want to convert the meat-eating people into uh, eating what they still perceive as meat, right? Without a compromise in taste, texture, and so on. Right now, there is some compromise, but I think they're they are sort of close to the frontier. There's still a price premium, but they are looking for ultimately achieving price parity. Because what they're after is saying, look, as we add more population to the earth, as people in the emerging markets become richer, there is just going to be more demand for for protein and for meat in particular. And then the only way to meet that uh, appropriately anyway is to bring these products to the market. And in terms of projections, we see a $1 trillion or a $2 trillion market here uh, on, a, on a five or 10 year time horizon. If we go after people that like, this is my elder son, who like the taste of meat, but they've turned vegetarian or they are flexitarian, so, so they appreciate the fact that these products are indeed substitutes for meat for them without having to take a compromise in the experience of the customer. On the impact size side, a lot of these models are very uh, science-based. Um, let's see. So in particular, both Impossible and Beyond work with external parties, work with scientists, literally go back and say, OK, our burger on a life cycle basis, how does it compare uh, with an animal-based burger in terms of the water that, that is used, in terms of the land that's used uh, in raising the um, animals, in terms of uh, the global warming potential from deforestation and from the methane that, uh, that comes from the burps and the farts uh, of the animals and, and so on. And, and so forth, right? So, so the point is people that are seriously serious about impact, think through the impact side, measure it, and increasingly quantify it. And, and so the conversation about impact is not just a sloppy feel-good conversation in a lot of ventures um, anymore. So if I have to look at impact evaluation more broadly, right? So, so this is a conversation that's happening, going back to we were talking about planting trees and nature-based solutions. A lot of the progress that's being made is by rigorous testing of what models work. And from the point of view of the purists, the most rigorous way of testing is uh, what are called randomized control trials or randomized evaluations, where you just say, OK, here's a model of involving a community in aligning incentives, uh, typically in tropical low-income countries, for preserving their forests, where you know, there's some way of compensating um, people for not cutting down forests. And we'll do it by taking, in this case, it's uh, villages in Ghana, and we are going to take, I'm forgetting the exact number, let's say 60 villages in which we ran, 60 randomly selected villages in which we roll out the program, 60 in which we don't. And, and then we measure through pictures taken by satellite on how much more is the tree cover, and there's a 5% difference between the, that. You can do a calculation of cost-benefit analysis because you can translate that into how much more carbon is being sequestered and at a certain price of carbon in the US or UK or you know, whatever you consider uh, appropriate. What does that mean in terms of uh, uh, what is being achieved in this project? Another example is One Acre Fund, another organization that works with low-income farmers. They are very careful about claims of impact that they make, which is backed by evidence that they say, OK, look, we know that microfinance in general 
has been a hyped up sector, right? And microfinance even today makes up one fourth or so of the total impact investing portfolios. And the reality is microfinance, in particular microfinance lending, simply hasn't had the kind of impact that most microfinance organizations claim. There's not a lot of research that backs it. And One Acre Fund says, but hang on, we have a different microfinance model because our customer is only the farmer our loans are optimized to the needs of the farmer at reasonable interest rates, and the loans are specifically for funding the inputs that the farmer needs, the fertilizers and the seed and so on. And we are also going to not just uh, you know, stop there, we are going to connect the farmer to the market, and we are going to train the farmer on the basic uh, practices that we know increase productivity of farmers. Right? So again, the focus is, here's a problem, the, particular customer segment, in this case the farmers, the low-income farmers in East Africa who don't have high productivity, what would it take for them to increase productivity? And it's based on data where they are able to show that you know, a farmer in the one-acre fund program relative to a farmer not in the program has significantly higher uh, income, and that income actually translates significantly to better health outcomes, better education outcomes. So it's not just cheap talk that look, we are giving loans to farmers in the villages, so we are having impact. This is actually a clear strategy on how is the impact happening and what is the evidence, perhaps ideally for some of these cases verified through third parties, right? So just like we, would, we wouldn't expect income statements from a, a, a company to be credible if they wrote it up and there's no auditing, the conversation in the impact space also is also measurement, but then the measurement that's uh, at some point uh, independently uh, verified. Now, does this mean everybody needs to be doing massive evaluations and experiments? Not necessarily, right? And so some of you might be available, might be aware of the RISE Fund, which was a, when it came out, started the largest impact investing fund, uh, which was started by TPG RISE um, a, a, a few years ago. And their whole argument was, look, we just the fact that we care about impact doesn't mean we have to go run the evaluations, but there's enough body of evidence that's building from research cumulatively being done globally in any space. And now when we do an investment, we are still going to expect the same IRR that we expect on a risk-adjusted basis in any given setting, but we are also going to look for evidence that exists on the impact side that's published in a credible journal through a credible research methodology, right? So, so that's where some of these conversations are on the frontier. Spe specifically in the case of the RISE Fund, what they do is they go further and they say, we are actually going to put a dollar value. We are going to put a dollar value, for example, their first investment was an organization called EverFi, which is an ed tech company in the US. And they said, EdTech has three products that we think are most impactful, and we are going to put a dollar value on uh, the impact that they have. The first is Alcohol Edu, which is a, a, a program for college campuses. So their customer is, is colleges, it's not I individuals. Uh, a mandatory program for people entering many colleges in the US, and there is evidence that uh, going through their program reduces incidence of alcohol-related abuse and even deaths on campus, right? The second is Haven, which is a program they run related to sexual assault, uh, making people aware of issues like consent, date rape, things like that. And what they do is they again have evidence, though slightly less rigorous than the alcohol issue case, of studies which shows that this leads to a certain quantitative decrease in incidence of sexual assault on campus. And then the third one is a program ever, uh, that they run with high school students on making them more aware of financial literacy. And again, they have longitudinal data on how much the consumer debt these uh, students hold, the credit card debt that they hold gets reduced once they've gone through their programs. And what they do is for all of this, they put a dollar value, and then they aggregate it up to a single number, and then they say, on the basis of per dollar social impact being generated in dollar terms, we are going to have a cutoff of 2.5. So in addition to meeting IRR requirement on any particular investment, we need a requirement now of uh, social returns on investment of $2.5 dollars for every dollar being invested, right? So, so this conversation is a little bit sort of where 
the frontier debates are happening. Because what they have in mind is something, you know, if you think more broadly of the broader conversations that are happening, is viewing a company as having a bundle of impacts, translating on them all to dollar value, and aggregating it up and saying, this is what a company is worth on a financial basis. This is what it would be worth if we also adjusted for impact. So, so these are, you know, very ambitious sort of projects, but I would say also very early stage projects where the conversation still needs to get a lot more sophisticated because I'm personally not so convinced that we are at a point where we can add up. First of all, we can credibly believe every single dollar number in terms of this is our you know, dollar value of the environmental impact, this is our uh, impact for the poorest workers, and this is our impact for uh, workers who are a little less poor, because it raises a lot of questions both on what are the assumptions. For example, is 100 euros a ton appropriate price for carbon? Is it 10 euros a ton? Is it 300 euros a ton? What discount rate should you be doing? You know, should the discount rate in the environmental space really be the same as business? Because effectively what that means is, if you start putting a 5% discount rate in our environmental impact, you're basically saying our grandchildren really don't matter once in these spreadsheets, right? And these are, I think, ethical issues which are very important issues which the, 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 the business community and the finance company hasn't yet gotten to, right? And, the, and this conversation is actually a conversation that is not a new conversation. It's just the conversation that has been happening in the uh, moral philosophy space and political philosophy space for more than 100 years. It's just new to the business world. And we are rediscovering it. And what worries me a little bit is we are reinventing it without really understanding fully the work that has happened in this space for a century. So for example, here's a study from 1937 where a psychologist was trying to do exactly that, put a dollar value on every single impact. And uh, what the psychologist said was, OK, I'm going to go and I'm going to do a survey of people. Uh, this was in the US on how much would they have. So, so the idea was, you know, every pain and pleasure that the end person has has a dollar value to it. And I'm going to show that you can put a dollar value to everything. In this particular case, the question being posed to people was, how much would you need to be paid to have an upper front tooth pulled out? And remember, this is from the days before anesthesia, so it's a little bit more painful than it is now. Uh, have a little toe of uh, one foot cut, eat a live six inch earthworm, choke a stray cat to death with bare hands, and live the rest of life on a farm in Kansas. Now, I don't know what's with Kansas. It was there in Anil's presentation yesterday, and it is in my presentation today purely by uh, coincidence. But what do you think? Which of these you would have to be paid the highest for if, if you know, people were asked in 1937? How many think have an upper front tooth pulled out? Anybody think that? E, have a little toe of one foot cut off? OK. Eat a live six inch earthworm? That's easy peasy, right, for most of you? Uh, <laughs> choke a stray cat to death with bare hands? Many cat lovers in this audience, clearly. Um, live the rest of life uh, uh, on a farm in Kansas. I can see why for, for INSEAD people that might be particularly hard. I think it's hard enough for anybody. Um, it turns out in this particular case, it was indeed the life in, in Kansas. Uh, but the second, and I don't know if this is about the time or the place or uh, people's taste at that point, it looks like eating a live six inch earthworm was much yuckier in those days than it is now. But I think the point of this exercise is as much to illustrate, you know, we would say, how high is the variance across people? So essentially, when we are trying to measure impact, we are trying to say we as society recognize and we are going to put the same value on a particular outcome for each of the 7 billion people on Earth. And, and so that's how ambitious the project is. And you can see why. On ethical grounds, it's, it's hard. And it's also hard on very practical grounds, right? Because the assumption here is we have perfect data on all possible impacts on every single project that we ever do. 
And if you're really doing that, then the complete point of having a market economy is lost, because this is exactly what central planning was supposed to be do doing. And in fact, the only thing you've done is you've replaced central planner with a finance dude who has a spreadsheet deciding the fate of the rest of humanity. Now, I used to think this is simply not doable. Uh, now, I think actually the problem is, even if it's not perfectly doable, people are saying, you know, we can make progress on this uh, without fully recognizing that there are moral implications of these decisions. And what's going to happen, and this is what concerns me, is that the subjective values of people in power and people with money get imposed on the rest of the society. And, and so this is something to be a little bit sensitive and cautious about, in my view, but you know, this is just my view, and this is a space in which, this is a hotly debated space uh, with, a, with a lot of debate that's happening. So you know, just for the last five minutes, let me uh, wrap up, and I think we have about 15 minutes for questions then. To me, the, uh, when we talk about impact, especially when we're quantifying impact, I appreciate the point of view that several years ago, Brian uh, Trustad, who was then the CIO of Acumen uh, Impact Investing Fund, had said, which is the value is not in the number uh, that is spit out at the end, but in thinking through whether or not we are really generating a social impact, right? So it's about a bunch of people sitting together, asking each other tough questions on have we thought about all dimensions of impact, what are the assumptions built in there, if we change the assumptions, what happens, and if in different scenarios the impact looks very different, then what do we think about it, and how do we make progress on doing better? So the other thing I, I think as a business community we have to be very sensitive about when we're talking about impact is are we just doing bandit, which happens all the time, which is, uh, there are certainly these two books which are pretty harsh on business. So if you have a little bit of a thin, thick skin, I would still encourage you to read these two books. This more on the social impact side and this more on the climate impact side on how business by a lot of initiatives that look positive at the surface end up postponing or pushing back societal level, systems level change. Uh, which, you know, in the bigger scheme could be uh, a step, you know, one step forward, two step back. You know, perhaps some of this criticism is unfair, but it's sort of worth looking it up because in my mind, the best way to improve is to listen to the critics rather than just congratulate each other. And then, yes, it's up to us to use our judgment on saying which of these, uh, you know, criticisms are valid and we'll do something about and which of these are unfair and I'm just going to um, ignore. But the broader point is a lot of the initiatives that we talk about, certainly in the business space, are at the upper uh, two of these arrows in what a systems uh, thinking kind of diagram would look like. But that's also, by the way, a concern in the development space more broadly. And we do need to think about, we as society, how do we, you, you know, what are the power structures, what are the mental models, what are the assumptions that underlie everything we do as society? And a lot of this, in my mind, is about starting very early, about education, awareness, and so on, which, you know, takes a generation, really, to, to flush through. The other thing I think that's very important it is, and this is a point made by uh, uh, this monk who unfortunately passed away uh, recently. He was a Vietnam refugee to France who set up uh, uh, this organization called the Plum Village, which is based here in France, um, which is a Zen monastery. Uh, but what is interesting about uh, this crowd is, unlike a lot of other Buddhist groups which are not engaged with society, right? They're completely separate. For them, this whole thing about mindfulness, meditation, and all of that is very closely inter in interwoven with societal issues, in particular ar around climate and climate justice. And, you know, there were two of them at the COP uh, last year, uh, as well, two representatives. And their point of view is that well being of the individual is very importantly interwoven with well-being of the society. And the reason why a lot of these problems exist the way they do is we have created a world in which we are too centered on this individual, and so the individual themselves are very unhappy a lot of the times 
because they're just focused only on themselves, while uh, at the same time they disconnect themselves uh, from the rest of the world. So, so what leads to a lot of the, in, in this philosophy, uh, what leads to a lot of the dissatisfaction with life and mental issues and, and all of that is exactly what is also now leading to issues like people not caring enough about uh, the climate and so on. Similar issues from a very different point of view have been raised in, in philosophy. John Rawls, a uh, long time ago, wrote this book called A Theory of Justice, where he pointed out that we have to recognize that yes, all of, you know, a lot of us are very smart people who work very hard to get here, but we should not forget uh, that an important piece in our success is the pure chance, right? Uh, and, and it starts with, uh, with the lottery of birth, you know, exactly you, born in a different family, in a different part of the world, not having the same parents or the same teachers or the same ecosystem, the same infrastructure, would not have gotten you where you are. And this is something sort of to keep in mind, so that when we're talking about impact, I think approaching it as a favor to anybody or to others is, is not the right approach. I think it should be that we are doing exactly what we should be doing just as a, a responsible person of humanity. And this issue gets even more exaggerated in the context of climate, because if you think about it, you know, the richest 1% of the people have more uh, carbon emissions than uh, the bottom 50%. And by the way, who's going to suffer is the bottom 50%, because the richest one would, you know, if Miami goes underwater, they'll find a way to buy a house somewhere else. Uh, the, the, the real issue will be faced by uh, the poorest of the world. And, you know, all of that might sound pretty depressing, but just to leave you uh, on a positive note, just to, and I hope this gives you something to think about over champagne at the ball. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hopefully not. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get a chance to enjoy it more. But, uh, but, you know, some productive conversation. So my point here was more to raise questions than provide answers. But, you know, most importantly, I want to leave you with this quote which says, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito in, in the room. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.